Hi everyone, today we're going to be realizing a floored species exercise in three parts. A quick caveat, when I teach floored species in three parts, two of the voices are in floored species, not just one. If you haven't yet, take a look at my floored species video in two parts to review some basic rhythmic rules associated with the species. All those rules will transfer to three parts, but we have to consider a new rule as well. Basically, in every bar, Every beat needs to be marked at any given time. What do I mean by this? Let's look at bar two. We know we have four beats per bar, but notice beat two isn't marked. We have a C sharp and an A being held out through beat two, and this isn't allowed because it kills the rhythmic vitality of the lines. In contrast, beat three is marked by an A and beat four by a quarter note G and thus are properly treated. You always have to have some sort of rhythmic activity going on in each beat while of course following the rhythmic guidelines I outlined in my two part video. But because beats one and two are improperly treated, this first example is a no go. As is often the case with counterpoint, there is an exception to this rule. In this second example, beat two isn't marked, but it's actually okay because it involves a dissonant suspension. If there's a dissonant suspension and it has to be dissonant, then we don't have to mark the second beat because of the tension created by the dissonance. Notice, however, we do mark beat four with a quarter note G in the bass. There's no dissonant suspension involved here, so it has to be marked. Example three is also okay because beat two, while not marked in the bass, is marked by the B in the alto. So remember, there has to be a constant rhythmic flux going on at all times. Before jumping in, let's listen to our cantus. Many canti often open with scale degrees 1 and 2 as shown here. Whenever this occurs in an upper voice, you can have a 2-3 suspension in the bass. You'll notice that the second beat is not marked by a quarter note in neither of the floored parts. But because we have a dissonant suspension, it's allowed. Don't forget about suspensions in the bass. I know most of us are used to the 7-6 and 4-3 suspensions that occur in upper voices, but those bass suspensions can really come in handy. I knew that at bar 3 I would want an E in the bass, so I had a D occur in passing to help me arrive there smoothly. I could have actually had the C sharp at bar 2 be a half note as well, but I preferred filling in the gap of a third between the C sharp and the E. As for the alto part, since we aren't allowed whole notes, I knew I had to put something on the third or fourth beats, and I chose to leap up to the unison on the fourth beat and have a quick little passing tone D lead me down to the C sharp. Remember, Unisons aren't allowed on strong beats, but they're fine on weak beats. We always need to be thinking ahead in counterpoint, so when I saw this A in the cantus, I realized that putting an F-sharp in the bass would allow for a 7th suspension in the alto. Now I just needed to figure out how to lead the E to the F-sharp. Pause the video and see if you can figure out some way to do this. There are multiple answers, but remember, we're going to at the very least need a quarter note or two eighth notes on beat four in order to fulfill the rhythmic requirement I outlined at the beginning of the video. I went for the double neighboring figure here because it gives us a nice melodic line and creates six between the bass and alto. Instead of being a lone passing note, the D is now accompanied with the upper neighbor F sharp a six below. In general, passing and neighboring tones sound really great when accompanied in thirds or sixths. As my teacher would always say, passing and neighboring tones don't like to be lonely. Of course, we have to resolve our dissonant seventh on beat three as we did here. But remember, we are allowed to interrupt the dissonant suspension before the resolution if we touch another chord tone. In this case, I leapt down to A because I felt we needed a leap in this alto part after having mostly stepwise motion. I keep the bass part pretty motionless here, it just had a run of 6 quarter notes, so this creates a nice contrast that allows the listener's focus to shift from the bass to the now more active alto. Notice how thus far we've had a stepwise ascent occur in the bass with scale degrees 1 at bars 1 and 2, scale degree 2 at bar 3, and scale degree 3 at bar 4. I thought, why not continue this and land on scale degree 4 at bar 5. Once I decided on that, 
I realized that D major can act as the dominant of G major. And in counterpoint, we are allowed one chromatic alteration. If I can somehow squeeze in a passing or neighboring C natural, then I can have a nice tonicization occur. This would be especially nice because it was very common in common practice period music to tonicize the fourth degree near the end of a piece. With that in mind, I knew I had to land on a B in the alto over the four chord because otherwise I'd have an incomplete chord without a third. Remember, incomplete chords should at least contain a third whenever possible. The C natural then worked perfectly as a passing tone to connect the D and B. Let's take a listen to this and pay close attention to how the tonicization sounds. Because we know we have to end on tonic, I personally wanted to avoid outlining a tonic harmony at measure 6 and do something different to keep things interesting. Instead of tonic, I decided to land on the 6th chord, and in order to make this happen, I created an illusory deceptive cadence. While A and C sharp are passing notes, they also happen to create a dominant 7th chord with the cantus. You're probably thinking, wait, aren't we only allowed one harmony per bar? Well, this dominant 7th that occurs on beat 4 is a complete coincidence. As I said, the A and C sharp are just passing tones that ultimately prolong the 4 chord. So it is possible to create the illusion of multiple harmonies within a bar if those quote-unquote secondary harmonies are a byproduct of non-harmonic tones. After this, I plugged in this typical cadential formula in the bass that I recommend everyone just memorize. Remember, normally, anapestic rhythms, that is, short, short, long rhythms, aren't allowed in counterpoint unless the long rhythm is tied as it is shown here. They are allowed, however, even without a tie at the penultimate bar. As for the alto part, I really wanted to have this 7th between the soprano and alto occur above the D in the bass because it's one of my favorite sonorities. And finally, I had the 7th occur in passing, resolving to the 3rd of the tonic chord. Let's take a listen to the whole thing. I think this sounds quite good, especially the tonicization and the movement into the pseudo-deceptive cadence. So that's it. This will be the last video on species counterpoint for a while. I'm going to focus on doing a few analysis videos from here on out so we can see how these principles are put to practice. And after that, I think I'll continue my harmony series and talk about realizing figured basses, unfigured melodies, fugues, and chorales. So I hope you all stick around because things are only going to get more interesting from here on out. Thanks for watching everyone, don't forget to share and like this video. If you're interested in lessons, you can contact me on Instagram at BachToTheBasics or by email at BachToTheBasics14 at gmail.com. Thanks again and see you next time.